Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Bioenergy Research Initiative Virtual Field Day uh, on this somewhat overcast rainy day. My name is Tom Ranney. I'm a professor of horticultural science at NC State University uh, and have the good fortune of leading a plant breeding program that focuses on diverse crops including some of the bioenergy crops you can see here. Let me tell you where we are. Uh, we are in western North Carolina, technically in Hooper's Creek, about 15 miles southeast of Asheville, uh, at a family farm owned and operated by Brian and Linda Upchurch. Uh, they uh, also run uh, Carolina Truffiers, which is a truffle farm, and you might be able to see some of the truffle orchards in the background uh, as we're walking around. Um, we have been working on breeding bioenergy grasses uh, for some time, and we've been focusing on a group of plants that are perennial, large-growing uh, grasses that generally fall into a category of the sugarcane complex. So it includes sugarcanes and sugarcane relatives. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as energy canes or as energy grasses. Uh, and there's good reason for focusing on these crops. Uh, they are generally considered to be some of the best plants for converting solar radiation into harvestable biomass. Uh, and they can do it on a big scale. Uh, these plants can generate as much as 15 or 10 to 15 dry tons per acre per year, which is substantial. And one of the things that's uh, amazing is they can do it with very few inputs, particularly nutrients. Uh, you can get these high yields often with little or no nitrogen fertilizer, which is uh, pretty unusual. Uh, and they do that uh, in a number of ways. They've got some tricks. Uh, one of which, and you can see this here, is that in the fall they start to senesce and they remobilize carbohydrates and nutrients back down uh, into the roots, into the rhizomes where they're stored over the winter so that they're available in the spring. They also have associations with uh, nitrogen-fixing endophytes, microbes that actually live in the plant uh, and uh, fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere that supplements the nitrogen that the plants can uh, take out of the ground. So very efficient, they're adaptable, uh, uh, very well suited for growing across North Carolina. They have uh, very few disease or insect pests, uh, and uh, they can be used for all sorts of multiple purposes. Uh, they can be used uh, for bedding for animals, they can be used for uh, landscape applications where, uh, for erosion control mats, they can be used uh, for uh, industrial products like particle board or nursery containers. Uh, they can also be used uh, ultimately for cellulosic ethanol and bioplastics. Uh, so broad applications as well. So the plant behind me is Miscanthus giganteus. It's an interesting plant. Uh, it was found in the wild. It's naturally occurring. Uh, it's a hybrid between two different species. Uh, and it's also a triploid, meaning that it has three sets of chromosomes. Uh, so uh, one uh, result of that is that the plant is seedless or sterile, highly infertile. Uh, and that's good uh, in that it can't reseed and become a weed. Uh, so we like that aspect of it. Uh, this plant has been around for a long time. It was first introduced into Europe into the 1930s. Uh, it's been grown around the world and studied, uh, and it's sort of the gold standard for a bioenergy crop, particularly in more temperate regions because it's so cold hardy. Um, the grass uh, has a good biomass. Uh, it is well adapted, but up until recently there was only one clone, so very limited genetic diversity. Uh, so we engaged in a, a breeding project about 10 years ago with a couple of objectives. One, we wanted to see if we could broaden the gen genetic diversity so that we aren't planting monocultures which are subject to disease and insect problems. And two, we wanted to see if we can improve the adaptability and biomass yields. Uh, so we started on this project uh, over a decade ago. It involved multiple generations. We used traditional breeding approaches, uh, recurrent selection, and uh, are now in our third generation. And after growing thousands of plants, uh, we've reduced those populations down to our top 15. And what we have here in this plot is essentially a variety trial where we have our top 15 varieties and the original Miscanthus giganteus. Uh, and are evaluating those. These are in their fourth growing season. We harvest them every year. Uh, so we've harvested them 
three times thus far and we're getting ready to harvest them in about three more weeks. Uh, so I'd like to cut away. I can show you some data on the yields of these grasses uh, over time. Uh, and if you can see this plot on the left side of the plot, the y-axis, uh, it has our biomass yields in dry tons per acre. And on the bottom axis, the x-axis, it has the 15 different varieties. Uh, and Miscanthus giganius, the original clone, is on the left-hand side of the graph. Uh, you can see there are three different colors for the bars. Uh, blue is 2017, orange is 2018, and the gray is 2019. Uh, so you can see last year's harvest 2019 for the original Giganteus on the left. It was about nine dry tons per acre. All of our additional 15 either met that uh, yield or exceeded it, some by as much as 50 to 60%. Uh, so that's great progress. That's, that's a substantial increase in yield. Um, one of the biggest costs in growing bioenergy crops is the land. So if you can increase your yields per unit area, uh, you can increase your profits per unit area. Um, so we're excited about that. Okay, one of the questions you might has, have is if these plants are seedless, how do you propagate them? Well, there are a couple of options. Uh, you really need to prop propagate them vegetatively. And one option is to do it by rhizomes. And if you look at uh, these roots, these modified stems are called rhizomes. Uh, and you can see that they have actually shoots, uh, the beginnings of shoots and buds. So you can propagate uh, Miscanthus by these uh, rhizome pieces, and they're actually companies, uh, one in North Carolina called Agrotech, uh, which has developed systems for digging uh, and planting these in an automated way. Um, so that's one option. Alternatively, uh, you can propagate them in tissue culture, and this is uh, some a micropropagation uh, tissue culture uh, plantlets that Dr. Darren Tuchel uh, developed in our lab. Uh, and there are companies that will actually take these plantlets and encapsulate them uh, and can plant them in something that resembles an artificial seed. Uh, so th those are two different ways uh, that they can be propagated and planted. Um, so in terms of where this research is going and moving forward, uh, we have been working on this for over a decade now. Uh, we have been in a very good position to apply for a Department of Energy grant and we received that uh, that uh, is expanding these efforts. We now have 10 faculty at NC State working on this project uh, with cooperators at Oak Ridge National Labs and industry partners where we are expanding trial sites, uh, planting these across the state, uh, and evaluating and developing them for uh, commercial and sustainable production. So with that, uh, I would like uh, to thank um, our cooperators, our staff, uh, the Upchurch family here, and the Bioenergy Research Initiative uh, for supporting these efforts and this research, uh, and thank all of you for watching.